said that the minister was proposing the legalisation right. uh, of cannabis. And I, my understanding is that's not what he's proposing at all. Um, so I don't know. Kevin, do you want to say something? I mean, like, in, in Colorado, the headline was Colorado decriminalized marijuana after they really legalized the candy bars and everything else. And, and my point of saying that is that it, these, these terms get conflated and confused. And frankly, it's in the interest of the legalization campaigners for them to be conflated and confused. Because if you can, if you can interchange medicalization, legalization, decriminalization... Um, you sort of just trick the public into thinking that everyone is in favor of this, and if you're not in favor of it, you're some backward-thinking Neanderthal old-school person. There's actually an entire organization um, you, you mentioned, George Soros, Deirdre, so I'm going to tell. I'll take it as well. Uh, there's an entire organization of one person uh, funded called the Marijuana Majority. Their only mission is to make it look like the majority of people are in favor of some kind of relaxation of policy. And they thrive on that confusion because you know what they do? They have a website, you should go to it, where they color code different people based on their support for medical, legal, or decriminalization. And they say, these are all people who are part of the marijuana majority. Now, the majority of people who look at this are not going to be noticing the different colors on the background and saying, ah, oh, okay, so their medicalization, their decrease. Maybe some academics who are reading that might. But the, the people just see all these famous people who are okay with some version of it. And they think, oh, well, if these people endorse. So my point is they thrive on that kind of thing. But they are all very different things. But even beyond them being different things, legal, decrim, medical, even beyond that, within the term, that was my point earlier, within the term, there are differences of opinion. So decrim for who, for what amount, for what drugs, where, in what context uh, is one example. Legal is even could be different. Legalization of what? Of use, of possession, of home growing only, of growing and giving it away, of growing and selling it, of retail selling it, state-sponsored sales. I mean, so... There's just, there's just a huge array, and I think it's important in the field that we just get very specific about what we talk about. So when I have a radio person or TV saying, are you in favor of decriminalization? And I answer that question. I say, I'm in favor of getting rid of criminal penalties for a person with a joint in their pocket who needs treatment, but I'm not in favor of just walking away and saying, here's a fine and go home. I'm in favor of seeing if they need treatment, getting them treatment, and getting them help. And that's, you know, that's my opinion. You may have a different one, but I think it's important to answer the way you want to answer, and rather than get stuck on some of these some of these terms that are out there. Thanks, uh, Kevin. Okay. Any other questions from the Hello, I um, just want to say first of all, thanks very much for your both, both your uh, presentations. My name is uh, Councillor David Hines, I'm from Wexford County Council. But I'm also uh, an addiction counsellor, so more of two hats. And very interesting to listen to this morning. I suppose two things would strike me, and uh, because uh, there's such a huge, uh, uh, I suppose, pressure, if you like to call it that, from people who say, we should be criminalized because there's no doubt that there's uh, so many people caught up in the whole prison, uh, you know, as you said, people in prison and so on. And uh, to try and separate the, if you like, the crime from people who need treatment. And the problem we have in, in Ireland, I don't know whether you're, you're, the two people would agree with that, but we've had a, a major uh, hit on the, the whole treatment uh, uh, approach. Uh, treatment in Ireland costs a lot of money, yeah. for a start. If you have uh, insurance, VHI and so on, you, you're, you should be okay. But unfortunately, the drugs projects all over the country were, were, were hit by the by this recession, I'd say roughly by about a third. It was never very good in the first place. So we have all that. So the trouble is, while I agree whole, wholeheartedly with what you're saying about the drugs courts and so on, but it's the follow up mm -hmm. that is yeah. the big problem in this country, usually, yeah. because uh, neither recovery, uh, drugs treatment, alcohol treatment, or mental health were seen as important enough 
they took a major hit in the recession, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And just uh, one other comment as well as what you're saying about, uh, it's strange because I'm a socialist myself that the, the major, uh, I suppose, demand is coming from the left wing people. And I would say most of them would be horrified to see that these uh, hugely uh, capitalist corporations are actually the ones that are actually pushing this more, more, more so than, than any, anyone else. So, thanks. Um, Mr. Thorne, mm -hmm. I don't have any answers about the treatment other to say that in the UK it's very similar. And before the general election in 2010, in the 24 months leading up to that, about 24 rehabs closed. There was less than 100 in the country. So in the coalition, another 18 or so closed. There was a year's grace and another 18. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the last government had promised, especially in Duncan Smith, that you know, rehab capacity would increase tenfold. And instead, you know, so you know, we're now down to 24 and 18 is 42. 42 rehabs closed out of less than 100. So about half the capacity is gone. And at the same time, the government might be doing something right but with the wrong motives, which is they finally saying they, you know, they support 12 step and recovery, etc. There's a whole load of nuances, including definition of recovery. But my cynical side sees that they are supporting people to go into free 12-step groups instead of treatment as opposed to complementary to. And they're also now get, you know, cutting back on methadone and things, which might be the right thing to do, but only if it's replaced by more appropriate treatment. And it's not. It's about cutting, 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 cutting back. Um, so I don't have a solution unless people can band together. And I think the, also the problem is that the, the government departments that might benefit are, are separated out. They say they're integrated, but they're not. We had a huge campaign a few years ago um, under the coalition to get more power to rehabs and everything. Mm -hmm. And what they have done is they have devolved the decisions. All the commissioning is now done locally. So they say this is great. But what it means, there is absolutely no person or no department in central government that is accountable. Mm. And all the rehabs cannot gather together anymore because they are working or trying to influence their local commissioner. So why would somebody from another part of the country come with them? Sometimes they do because of friendships, but they have hardly any influence. So it's not about all the rehabs or all the treatment services, the other kinds that complement them, banding together to lobby one identified person in central government. They've got rid of that with local commissioning. I'm very, very cynical. I'm sorry about that. You know, after decades of work, that, and I always thought what we had to do was get the message out. Mm -hmm. And it never occurred to me that once they got the message, it would just be about more and more and more covert behavior to cover it up. You know, I, I do think that you're onto something when you talk about you know the the sort of cognitive dissonance between the uh, you know sort of a socialist perspective and the perspective of the capitalists in Wall Street. You know, I, I often say that the values of the hippies have been replaced by the values of Wall Street bankers in the marijuana business. You know, it used to be about something else. Well, the other part of that, which is related, is and maybe it's different here. So you should tell me in your community if it's different. But I'll tell you in the United States when you go to a city like any major city, Baltimore. Washington DC, Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, Dallas, New Orleans. Where are the liquor stores located? And you just think about that. Maybe it's different here, you can tell me. People are saying it's not different. They know what I'm getting at. There are eight times as many liquor stores in poorer marginalized communities in the, in the United States. You can't find a fresh piece of broccoli, but you can find uh, checks cashed, payday loans, liquor stores, and maybe a Chinese takeout. And why is that? Well, it's because the industry focuses on those who are the poorest. They have the least likely chance to have stable health care, housing, access to mental health treatment. What does that mean? It means they're more likely to slide into addiction. And remember, for these industries, addiction equals profit. They only profit off of addicts, no one else. So you there's a people say well why don't they have the liquor stores in the richer communities because they have the money to spend on that no they they put them in the most vulnerable and that's another when you think about you know we want to protect and, and certainly on, on, folks on the left talk about we're protecting the little people we're not protecting the bankers and capitalists we're protecting the working mom the person who's 
um, doesn't make a lot of income. Well, that is the exact person that is targeted by these industries. One particular group in one particular area, we have a family focus program where we did a drug education program. Um, but one week, a number of people didn't turn up for the session, and I thought this was going to be a disaster. But in fact, it was one of the most powerful <laughs> we had. It was the week after we had covered alcohol. Mm. So three of the women came back, and one said, I have to wait until a certain time to go over to the local shop. I can't go over too early, or they'll be looking at me. But if I go over around 7 o'clock, it's considered okay for her daily bottle of wine. Mm. And she has a child in addiction. She has a, she's wearing her children. She has a son, um, mental health issues, and uh, she was kind of rewarding herself every evening with a bottle of wine. But um, the other lady was Dyla Khan. Um, I'd never heard of Dyla Khan. Dyla Khan was a, a business card that's put in her letterbox, and you order your cans over mm -hmm. the phone, and you're charged double the price that they would cost in the off license to have them delivered. But she was getting her Dyla Khan, and the other lady, there was an issue of eight cans uh, a night that she was drinking and her her partner was using, I forget the amount of cannabis he was using, but he was given out to her for the amount of drink. But there was nothing said about the amount of cannabis that he had to buy each week. But the three of them, it was just funny, we, we talked about the, the research from the Matter Hospital and the work they were doing there. And each of them came back with something they were going to change. Um, so even though like, they're bombarded with stuff, their local pub had all these promotions, you know, the, the, the blacker tray, they call it the blackout tray. You might be familiar with it. It's a tray of drinks. There's two fat frogs on it, which has three drinks in it. There's a Smirnoff crush at the front. There's four shots. And there's another big drink. At the, I'm, I'm visualizing the tray in my own. But they're bombarded with stuff. And I just, it just, I just remembered it when you spoke about this. I don't know whether we had more off licenses mm. in disadvantaged areas than the advantaged areas in Ireland. I don't know that, mm -hmm. but I do know that, that um, disadvantaged areas are certainly bombarded. Yeah, yeah so it's yeah. Yeah. I actually have one question on my list there, you on, yeah. I just have to have a presentation, but recently I went to um, the debate with Richard Branson and Aon O'Reilly and Peter McFerry was at it too, and they spoke about the money that would be saved through mm. not sending people to, to prison to be redirected back into drug rehabilitation and prevention, prevention measures and stuff like that. And I wanted to know, in the States, how much of the tax revenue has been redirected into those sorts of things? Um, I'm just going to add, I will give it to you. I'm just going to add that the percentage of people in prison in the UK, I gave the US mm. figure for cannabis possession alone, is less than 1%. Mm -hmm. Less than 1%. So it's not going to make much difference. Mm. And then we're talking mm. about treatment, we're talking about the difficulty. I'm mm. going to hand it over to Kevin. I just wanted to make one point about the possibility of getting treatment. It's occurred to me. Um, and people might not know about this. It's the European Cross Border Directive. If you cannot get treatment in your country, mm. and you go to rehab in another country, they are obliged to treat mm. you. That government is obliged to treat you. Mm. Now, there's a rehab in Scotland called Castle Craig, and they're opening up a rehab in this country to take people in the UK. So the UK money's mm. going to come here, and the Irish government's going to pay it. But the Irish people, can go back to the UK and other countries to get treatment as well. But you do need to get familiar with the European Cross-Border Directive and certainly um, Peter McCann of Castle Craig would be a superb person for anyone. To, he, as far as I know, he's the most clued up person in the UK about it. Yeah. No. Uh, the answer to your question, how much of the one, uh, something under $100 million they've made so far off taxes has gone to treatment? Zero. That's how much. Uh, that was the promise, and the, uh, it doesn't go to tr treatment at all. In fact, some of it was supposed to go to school capital yeah. construction, and people thought that meant school books and school teachers. It didn't. It meant buildings, and they haven't received it yet either. And so uh, this is the promise that we always get. You know, for every dollar in alcohol tax that we get in the United States, every dollar also in tobacco revenue, we spend 10 on the social costs of alcohol and tobacco. So every dollar we get, we spend 10. And I think for cannabis, I don't know what the ratio is gonna be, but I have a feeling it's not gonna be 
um, the cost of the abuse are going to cost more. But nobody's counting the cost. That was part of the presentation is that the data is so bad. No one's saying, well, wait a minute, $22 million had to go into the bureaucracy. So that's a quarter of it already. <laughs> then we have the money. What about the increased car crashes? What about the increased police time for arresting the kids that now ha are there uh, with higher percentages of, of marijuana dealing and selling now that it's legal? So it just it's a very um, seductive argument. But with everything else, I, I don't know why we'd be fooled to think that with cannabis it's going to be different than with alcohol or anything else. I think that that's pretty much the, the sale technique. Yeah. All the people in this room that will be providing for my services is that you're going to get a kickback. Before. Yeah, absolutely. They say that. And mm -hmm. where's your, I mean, you should already, you have two sources of kickbacks already, right? <laughs> alcohol and tobacco. Gambling, three sources, right? But where, where are you collecting all that money? I mean, so, I mean, why are you going to be fooled a fourth time or fifth time? Um, this is part of it. Because people want to speak like Richard Branson and others in a way that the average person will say, yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, we want to get revenue. And so that's why those arguments are portrayed. Just really on the point of information, the European Medical Director, uh, I'm aware of somebody who's an addiction counselor who tried to uh, put uh, somebody who was uh, looking for a, a detox of uh, methadone uh, to Scotland, but if you actually read the small print, and um, you have to pay for your own travel, you have to pay for your own subsistence, you have to pay for the service, and then the money is reimbursed from the HSC. Mm -hmm. So the kind of the message was that is a drug user likely to get fifteen thousand, and then pass it on to the facility. <laughs> so there's a huge stumbling blocks, and it, it hasn't worked so far. Mm. It is worth looking at, and there is. Yeah. There is a, an office set up at the HSE for it. Yeah. Um, for, for the addiction area, I think it would be very difficult for people to allow. Uh, okay, we have a couple of minutes left, so um, I have a question here from somebody here. Two of the front. Yeah, I'm going to go on. No, I was just wondering there, you mentioned about the dabbing. And, mm -hmm. uh, the, the THC mm -hmm. 98% you said mm -hmm. uh, from the vape mm -hmm. Um has the regulation led to sort of any sort of mm -hmm. I don't know packaging or anything like that to say like we're going to have 20% THC or 15 or something like that no it's all fully legal and they said well we can regulate it so when you legalize it we'll regulate it so we'll put a percentage mm -hmm. cap on the on the THC they promised that during the campaign the minute it passed the industry said Cap? What cap? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're going forward. So no, you can buy that in a store right now, 98%. Mm -hmm. um, I think you mentioned something about there was a couple of class actions. Yes. Okay, so, will that lead to a cap? Well, do I don't know, but one of the class actions are from cannabis smokers themselves who are saying, what the gut we just found out that colorado is selling us cannabis with bacteria mold pesticide i mean as you know you know a lot of the cannabis that's grown these mass you know sort of indoor grows you see, you know, cannabis is a very thirsty plant so the reason why in california they're having second thoughts about legalization because we're in a huge drought and they're wanting to say well we need to grow cannabis and yet the cannabis is taking the water from the other crops so the the, the point is cannabis is a very thirsty in plant and especially high potency thc and so it means these guys are using a ton of water. I mean, they, you know, they're indoor. God knows how they're how it's happening. And mold is is having bacteria, pesticides. So the one of the class actions are from users suing the government. Who knows what's going to happen? The other class action is from the sheriffs in the in the in the law enforcement in the uh, state who are saying we weren't given more resources. And law enforcement in surrounding states saying we're now arresting ten times the number of people than we used to before legalization. They, you told us we were not going to be arresting anyone anymore. The criminal justice system was going to be out of this. It's increased. So will those lawsuits lead to something? I don't know. The American legal system is incredibly complex. It takes forever. And um, uh, there are going to be great lawyers on, on their side with the industry. And who knows? I, I don't know if it's going to lead to anything. But we, it may lead to something. But my point is, like with the tobacco lawsuits that took 100 years to have, do we need to wait another 100 years for problems, which is how long it took for us to wake up on tobacco in the States? Do we want to repeat that same mistake again? Any other questions? There's one right there. Go on. <coughs> Sorry, this is a, a question. Um, 
question on the cross border and and real income. I was just looking to see um, if like is that something you could be done in Ireland? Could you like could you bring some of the um, treatments in the north of Ireland? Um, well, theoretically, theoretically, yes. And I think the one that's been set up by Castle Craig is very near the border is very near the borders, but I don't know the ins and the outs. That's the thing, and I think it's like everything else, the devil is in the detail and the implementation. Um, the gentleman in the back, sorry, I don't know your name, has said HSC is aware of this, which is incredible that it does have the awareness, because so many places in England don't. Um, so something's there. I, it could be something to build on. It's a, I'll phrase it this way. It's a spark of hope, and it depends on how it gets in. Everything, it's Everything, every policy really, it's in the implementation. Um, but I think it's worth investigating. Did you want to say something? I'm going to leave on to the Any other questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. there's one here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you both for witty uh, presentations. I enjoyed them both immensely, and they were certainly eye opening and knocked a few shiblets on the head. <coughs> I'm reminded of uh, Senator Peter, the comment spoken here in the past, with a similar cynicism about uh, treatment modalities. We had a donation of uh, 12 step here for many decades. And I'm just wondering what would either of you like to comment on uh, what treatment modality you might particularly favour for addiction in general? Well, I mean, I, I'll, I'll leave it to the expert here, but um, <laughs> I, you know, uh, uh, I just think from what I've seen in the data, every uh, there's not one path. That there are different. Paths. In fact, most people stop using drugs for without treatment. They, they stop because they're going to get kicked out of their house from their girlfriend. They stop because it's destroying their life. Uh, our forty-first president, forty-third president, stopped because his, you know uh, stopped drinking in Texas because his wife was going to kick him out of the house, and that was all he needed. So <laughs> sometimes it's needed. Other people need. I've seen 12-step as a miracle for so many people. I have seen and heard and know that it works for so many people. Maybe for some people it does not work. I just think there are different paths, and we're, we're often creating this another false dichotomy of medication versus non-medication, 12-step versus not 12-step, this versus criminal versus treatment, legal versus health. And I just we shouldn't be making those those such such um, rigid dichotomies. I think. Please. Yeah. Exactly, um, and I always think it comes first of all to diagnosis, diagnosis, diagnosis. Is it somebody who is addictive has a physiology for it, has that <coughs> dysregulation of the dopamine histamine system, or is it somebody who is just abusing alcohol and drugs? And on the outside, it can be very difficult to tell the difference between. In, you know, you have somebody who uses a little, somebody who uses a lot, and in the middle are people who are addicted or people who are really heavy abusers. And okay, if you were going to do some kind of genetic test or whatever, or MRI or brain scan, you might find the difference. But they're very expensive. You're not going to do that on an individual level. Only researchers have the money for that at the moment. Um, so in the middle, you can't tell. And you can have people who are heavy drinkers, heavy users, who are not addicted, but have more, use more alcohol and drugs than people who are truly addicted, because it's not about the amount, it's what it does to you. Um, and so, when it, so but what I do say is, um, so, but if you do have that physiology to be addicted, if you are dependent, then you do need to stop, you know, because otherwise the system is going to be continuously triggered. You do need to stop completely. Some people can cut back, but it's again, diagnosis, diagnosis, diagnosis. And I do believe in the 12 step, but I believe in 12 steps as complementary. I mean, I see what I think is absolutely ridiculous, cognitive behavioural therapy versus 12 steps. Da, you go into any rehab, it's a complete eclectic mixture of dynamic therapies complemented by the 12 steps. They should work together. I'm, I'm doing some work with um, Dr. Andrew Barthwell, who used to be um, deputy drug czar in the United States. Um, we'll, we'll be in Florida in January, actually. Okay. And um, what we're going to do is um, we're, we're taking each step, and we've got a publisher, we, we're taking each step, and we're linking each step to the various therapies. Because the one same process is just described differently in the various therapies, but the processes of change are very similar. And I think what we, if we can get that through, that the 12 steps are complementary, uh, and maybe some of these really clever, highly trained therapists um, can get that message. You maybe only have one day's training in the 12 yeah. steps. You could increase the database. You could increase the workforce by maybe 10,000 people in the UK. I don't know what the numbers would be here. And once therapists in general 
actually recognise this and think they can deal with it instead of saying, oh, none of my, you know, really sick clients, none of them have a drink or drug problem at all, no. Um, then maybe we get more done as well and maybe they'll refer more people into treatment and rehab. So it's not simple, but I'm, I'm just into diagnosis, diagnosis and diagnosis again. Last word goes to Professor Thomas again. Oh, it's just a quick comment. I mean, the Belgian model looks so interesting, but we actually have done so much work in Ireland. We do have mm. the National Rehabilitation Framework mm -hmm. and we have an implementation committee and it was piloted, I think, in two task forces um, but it hasn't been rolled out. Mm. So that framework is about shared care planning with the, the client at the centre based on the needs, whether it's educational, social housing, drug treatment. We have that in Ireland. Loads of work was put into it, mm. but it hasn't been rolled out. Rolled out. So, you know, the Great. work has been done. So let's build on the good work that people have done. I agree. Okay. So, Captain, you're going to speak at my conference next May in London on that. <laughs> <laughs> you're committed. Evidence of the work they're doing in the addiction service, HD, adolescent addiction service. So it's worth a, a look at the poster um, just to see. All right. US training journal. Same as counsellor.